Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Terry Slevin. I'm with the Cancer Council. My role is Education Research Director. Uh, and this is the 21st anniversary of our Cancer Council update series, now in 2015. So we've been doing this a long time. So welcome. Delighted that you've uh, braved the weather to come out today to what I think is actually going to be a really fascinating topic, and I think it's a really interesting area of, of research, and we're delighted to be at the pointy end of that here in Western Australia. So today, Professor Michael Will Millwood is going to talk to us about the really interesting parts of medical oncology, and particularly the use of drugs that were not necessarily designed for cancer treatment to treat cancer. We're really fortunate to have Professor Millwood here today, uh, and sometimes when we look for experts to talk about the various cutting-edge topics in cancer, uh, we go from interstate or overseas, but today we didn't have to go far. Um, Michael is the Foundation Chair in Clinical Cancer Research, been funded by the Cancer Council WA since June of 2003. Um, he's also a consultant medical oncologist at Charles Gardner Hospital. Uh, he's also acted as head of the Department of, uh, of Medical Oncology. His previous appointments were as head of clinical research at Sydney Cancer Centre at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney and as consultant medical oncologist at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne. Uh, Michael has a very strong track record in delivering clinical trial outcomes, particularly with novel therapeutics and phase one and two studies. He's an international expert in thoracic malignancies and melanoma and between November 2008 and October 2012 was president of the Australasian Lung Cancer Trials Group. Michael's published more than 170 original papers in the peer review literature and over 270 abstracts in international meetings uh, as a presenter. Also please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Millwood. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, uh, Terry, and again, thank you all for coming out on what started out, at least, as a pretty miserable day uh, to hear uh, me talk about uh, a subject that I think is interesting. Uh, it's one of these things that people hear about, uh, and I hope as we go through it, uh, you will find it of value uh, to, uh, to listen to. Uh, and the title is uh, Teaching Old Drugs New Tricks, uh, repurposing drugs uh, to treat cancer. The themes that I'll be going through in this talk, and uh, depending on how time goes, we may not get through all of them, but uh, uh, I'm going to talk about what this idea of repurposing drugs actually is, uh, tell you a little bit about the new concept of cancer as not just a collection of cancer cells, but as a metabolic organ. Uh, then I'm going to talk about some drugs uh, that have entered this uh, repurposing space, uh, metformin, uh, thalidomide, which I'm sure you've all heard of, and it's uh, derivatives for treating myeloma, uh, and then a, a recent interesting uh, but ultimately unsuccessful story about using a certain antidepressants to treat a type of lung cancer. Uh, so this idea of drug repurposing, or as some people call it, repositioning, they mean the same thing, uh, is where we're finding new indications for existing drugs uh, that are outside the original indications for which the drugs were initially tested and maybe approved for use. Uh, and this is not something that's only confined to cancer, although I'll be talking only about cancer today. So we're talking about drugs that were initially developed for conditions other than cancer that are being looked at as potential cancer treatments. But this idea of drug repositioning or repurposing uh, can apply across all areas of medicine. So, for example, you might find new treatments for bowel disorders or other things among other drugs that were developed for other types of uh, diseases or conditions. So getting back to cancer, what we're talking about uh, is really one of three things, and um, uh, you'll see we'll cover all of these, but we could use an old drug to potentially treat someone with cancer and see if it can improve that cancer. Uh, we could use an old drug to... Uh, give to someone who's had cancer with the idea of reducing the risk of the cancer coming back again. 
or we could use an old drug to treat people who are at risk of cancer to reduce the risk of cancer developing. And all of these are valid ways of thinking about repurposing drugs uh, for cancer treatment. Now, one of the big advantages of this approach uh, is that when we use a new drug for the first time, i.e. it's never been used before, we know very little about it. Uh, we've generally done some animal testing or other experimental testing uh, to work out what the drug can do and what its side effects might be. Uh, but until you start giving it to people, you don't have a very solid understanding of what it will do, what the correct doses are, and what the side effects might be. Uh, but if you have a drug that's already been used for another condition, then potentially you can bypass this. So if a drug has already been used, then we know uh, at least something about its safety and side effects. We know what doses to give to people that will at least have some biological effects on the body. And if a drug has been approved for use and used in large numbers of people, we will have additional information such as what are the long-term cumulative effects and what are some of the rare side effects or effects on things like fertility uh, and uh, embryo development or teratogenicity. So this is an attractive concept because it could potentially speed up the process of developing treatments for cancer. Clearly, uh, to invent a drug, to do laboratory and preclinical tests and then start giving it to people uh, and then try and work out what are the appropriate doses and side effects can take a considerable amount of time. And if the drug is already uh, been used, then you can bypass a lot of these processes. For example, if you're going to give a drug to human beings, it has to be made in a way that's compatible with clinical use rather than just laboratory use. So it needs to be made to higher manufacturing standards and testing. And if that's already done, then that process is completed. You have some idea what doses to give to cancer patients, and you have some idea what side effects are likely to occur, so you can monitor for appropriate side effects. When you start with a completely unknown drug, you generally have to do a lot of intensive monitoring of the first patients treated, because you don't know what particular problems or side effects could arise. And all of these add to the time and expense uh, of developing new treatments. So potentially, this repurposing or repositioning drugs can get us new cancer treatments faster and cheaper uh, than uh, inventing new drugs. And I'm just going to show some slides from recent meetings. And I just want to show this slide to tell you that uh, actually doing trials of new cancer treatments is very, very expensive. And sometimes people don't understand how expensive it is. But uh, in this trial, uh, there are a number of trials done in different types of cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, comparing new treatments, and these are not repurposed drugs, but new drugs, in fairly large numbers of patients. Uh, but look at the cost of the trial somewhere between 25 million and 68 million US dollars. And that's just to do the trials, to get to that stage. So you can immediately see that the, doing this is a very expensive process. Uh, and the only way to recoup these costs eventually is to charge fairly high prices for the drug. Uh, so if we can reduce these costs, then theoretically, or in fact, not theoretically, hopefully practically, it will reduce the costs of the drugs that are eventually developed to the health system. However, there are some problems with this approach, uh, and I'll show these in some of the examples. <coughs> Firstly, we need to understand that developing pharmaceuticals for cancer and for all other conditions 
it is in essence a private sector activity. What it's relying on is private sector pharmaceutical companies to invest in research and development, in undertaking clinical trials with the endpoint that they will discover something that can be approved and that they can then sell. Now, in most countries, particularly in Australia, we don't see that process for what it is because we don't actually pay the full price of the drug. The government pays it on the subsidised PBS mechanism. But at the end of the day, it's like any private sector activity. And unless you can see a way at the end of it to generate profit, to keep your company going and satisfy your shareholders, then it's not going to be a successful company and you'll eventually fold. And if you have a repurposed drug that's been around for a long time, then it's very likely there won't be much intellectual property or patentability in continuing the development of that drug, even for another indication like cancer. Remember, when a new treatment is developed, it will have been patented and there will be a period where that company has exclusivity over its manufacture and sale. That's how our capitalist system works. Uh, if uh, someone finds a new use for a drug but which there is no intellectual property, then as soon as that's known, any other company can go along and make the drug and compete in that market without going through any of the uh, initial uh, cost developments. So we don't have a good way of squaring this other than saying if we're going to go down this approach, we are going to rely a bit more on funding from governments and non-private sources. Old drugs are not necessarily completely safe drugs. They can have some significant side effects. Uh, as some of you may know, there were a class of drugs, uh, including things like rosiglitazone and pioglitazone, that were developed for diabetes uh, and had some effects uh, in experiments on cancers. And there was a lot of interest in developing these. And in fact, some trials were started in cancer patients. However, as more work was done on diabetic patients, it became apparent that these drugs actually increase risks of heart attacks, uh, increase the risk of sudden death, and additionally could uh, potentially increase the risk of certain cancers. And these drugs were then withdrawn from the market. So just because a drug has been developed for another indication doesn't mean we know absolutely all about it. It may have unexpected side effects. Another cautionary tale is that uh, often uh, the doses needed of a drug to produce an anti-cancer effect are different to what are needed for the condition that the drug was initially developed for. Uh, and this is a particular problem uh, when people report laboratory experiments. And you'll often see reports of laboratory experiments that say this drug is active against this cancer, but what they don't tell you is you had to use such very high concentrations of the drug to produce an effect that there's no way that a human being could ever absorb or be administered that dose uh, to actually get to that level to affect a cancer inside a human being. We also, in many circumstances, don't know how long to treat patients for. It's a little easier if you're treating a patient who's got a cancer that you can monitor but if you're trying to prevent recurrence of a cancer, then often we just don't know how long to treat people for with old drugs. It can also be difficult to do clinical trials if a drug's already available for a different indication because many people will already be taking it for its initial indication. And as many of you know, the best way to test drugs is to do a randomised trial where some people receive the new treatment and other people receive uh, a, another treatment. And often that's done in a blinded way so people don't know which of the treatments they're having. But if the drug's already available, then people might just go out, might just go out and obtain it anyway because they think it might be helpful. 
and that will make the clinical trial very hard to interpret. We also need to be aware that older drugs are not necessarily the most effective way of using that particular chemical structure or chemical pathway against cancer. They may be just a starting point, and I'll go into that with the thalidomide story. So just to go down this story, that cancers are not just cancer cells. Cancers are more like an organ in the body that contain lots of different cell types, not just cancer cells, but they have lots of other cells intermixed with the cancer cells that form that thing that you can see on scans or that can be cut out sometimes or that is there that we call a cancer. And they contain other cells, including some that I've listed there, uh, fat cells, what we call uh, adipocytes, uh, supporting structural cells called fibroblasts, blood vessel cells that we call the vascular endothelium, and immune cells, including lymphocytes and others. And all of these are mixed together uh, around the cancer and throughout the cancer cells uh, in a way not dissimilar uh, to a normal organ of the body, which also contains many of those cells. And uh, I've shown this before at lectures, and I, I, I will show a few more slides like this, these cartoons that try and explain this. So in this one, we're looking at the interaction of a cancer cell with immune system cells. And here's the cancer cell at the top, and around it are many different immune-type cells. Uh, and these are pathways by which, through different proteins and different signaling molecules, information is passed between these different cells and the cancer cells, making them do different things stimulating the immune system, suppressing it, causing cell growth, causing cells not to grow. All these things are a constant two-way or multiple-way talk between different cells all interacting together, with the fundamental biology being that the cancer cells are growing, dividing and spreading in an abnormal way. So we've now started to refer to this concept as what's called the tumour microenvironment. In other words, around the cancer cells, there are systems of normal cells that have been recruited in to help the process of the cancer cells growing and developing. Because cancer cells are growing and dividing, and that means they need energy, they need nutrients. They need fats, they need essential amino acids, they need the things that cells require to sustain themselves and divide, and they have to get that from somewhere. And because they're growing rapidly and in, un, and in an uncontrolled way, they need lots of it. And they can source it from these surrounding cells. And this concept of the tumour metabolism is now very important. And here's another little cartoon that explains this process. So here's the cancer cell down here, and next to it are fat cells and supporting structural cells, fibroblasts and adipocytes. And they are talking to each other. And when they talk to each other, these cells become different to the cells that normally sit as fat cells and supporting cells around normal tissues of the body. And these cells become more metabolically distinct and they secrete things around the cancer cell like fatty acids and amino acids that can then replenish those cancer cells and allow them to grow. So this meta the metabolism of cancer cells is in some way because they can induce the body's normal cells to supply them with what they need. And we now know so much about this that we can look at these processes and say, well, hang on, maybe there are drugs that can interfere with this. And I, I, I 
didn't want to make a long, long list of all the re potentially repurposed and repositioned drugs, just some of them. Uh, and here's some of them. So here's the drug. Here's its original use. This is the target. And this is what's happening with clinical trials. So just quickly, chloroquine, which as some of you may know was a, developed as a drug to treat malaria, has effects on the cancer fibroblasts and there are trials being done, not here, not in Australia, predominantly in the US, to see if this drug can be a useful anti-cancer drug. This one I've talked about, these class of drugs developed for diabetes and obesity, did look initially promising but were then suspended because of the side effects of the drugs that became apparent. Uh, the next two drugs uh, are rarely used uh, in patients because they're used for very rare conditions. Uh, these are rare, mainly congenital diseases that affect uh, children and produce an abnormal metabolism throughout the body. Uh, and they can affect, though, these cancer fibroblasts. And there are trials that have been commenced using these drugs uh, to see if they can uh, treat cancer. Uh, metformin, we'll talk about, a drug widely used for diabetes uh, and is now in large clinical trials for cancer patients. Thalidomide, I'm sure you've heard about, originally developed for nausea and leprosy, not many people know this, affecting the cancer endothelium and immune cells and approved as an anti-cancer drug uh, for myeloma. Uh, so I'll start with the story about metformin, uh, which uh, is a very widely prescribed oral drug uh, that reduces blood sugar and improves metabolism in patients with type 2 diabetes. Uh, it's been around for more than 20 years and it's a very widely used drug. Uh, and it's generally very well tolerated. It has few side effects and although it does reduce blood sugar, even in people with diabetes, uh, it has uh, little risk of very low blood sugars uh, developing. Uh, it can be given for a long period of time uh, if you give high doses, it causes some nausea, but that's unusual, and it's cheap. And the story started with observations that were done. So people not particularly looking at treatment, but more at cancer epidemiology. And it was noted that patients uh, who were diabetic, who were treated with metformin, had a significantly lower risk of developing cancer than people with diabetes uh, who were not being treated with metformin, who were being treated with other types of uh, diabetic medication. Uh, and that's a big difference. Their, their chance of developing cancer was reduced by about a third. And the reduction seemed to apply not just to one or two types of cancers, but many different types of cancers. Now, that tells you that there's something, but it doesn't tell you really if that's an effect of taking metformin. It may be that the people who were taking metformin were different in some other ways. Perhaps they had higher physical activity levels or less smoking and so were at less risk of developing cancer. Or there's this thing called a time-dependent bias. If you've got diabetes and you develop cancer, then the likelihood is you will not survive as long as a diabetic who doesn't develop cancer. If you're a diabetic, your chance of receiving metformin will depend to some extent on how long you have diabetes because you might try different medications. So it may just be that metformin is being a marker for how long you have diabetes and that means your chance of not developing cancer because if you do, your time of having diabetes will be less. Does that sort of make sense? It, it does when you think about it. And so these sort of observational studies provide evidence of an association but not necessarily a cause. 
some more direct evidence came from looking at women uh, with breast cancer who were diabetic. And it was noted that these women who had early stage breast cancer and were treated with chemotherapy followed by surgery, and this is a, a widely used and potentially curative treatment for breast cancer, it was noted that the women who were taking metformin had a better effect of the chemotherapy on their breast cancer than the diabetic women who were not taking metformin. So we measure this by what's called a pathologic complete response rate. In other words, the, can the chemotherapy gets rid of the cancer, which is then the residual removed by surgery. So that happened in 24% of the diabetic women on metformin versus 8% of the diabetic women not on metformin versus 16% of the non-diabetic women who, of course, were not taking metformin. So this is a bit stronger evidence that this drug may affect the process of cancer and may, in fact, uh, be useful in combination with other cancer treatments. However, these are not randomised studies because clearly women were not randomised to receive metformin or not. So you don't know what other differences might have occurred uh, between this population. For example, what were the weights and other metabolic indices uh, in these women? Uh, so I looked online a few days ago and there are currently more than 200 clinical trials being done around the world to try and prove whether metformin is a useful anti-cancer drug. Uh, and I'll just, uh, I'll just tell you about a couple of these trials. Uh, the one uh, that's the largest is called the MA32 trial, and this trial is recruiting more than 3,500 women uh, who have been treated for early-stage breast cancer with chemotherapy, surgery, sometimes radiation treatment or hormones, and they will be randomised to receive metformin for five years or a placebo uh, to see if it does reduce the risk of cancer coming back and improve the long-term survival of breast cancer patients. This is a different trial called MAST. Uh, over 400 men with low-risk prostate cancer. So these are men with a diagnosis of prostate cancer, but it's considered a low risk and doesn't need immediate treatment. And they will be randomised uh, for to metformin or placebo for up to three years while their prostate cancer is monitored with PSA tests and biopsies. The idea being to see if metformin can control uh, low-risk prostate cancer and avoid the need for prostatectomies or other more invasive treatments. Uh, there's a trial in the US. Uh, I wasn't aware of this trial until the weekend when I found it, but uh, I like this. Uh, they are, have a much smaller trial for uh, patients having a certain type of radiation treatment for lung cancer. And they're giving a short burst of metformin at high dose for up to three weeks before the radiation treatment and then during uh, this stereotactic radiation treatment. Again, to see if the metformin can improve the effect of radiation treatment. Uh, there's another trial being done in prostate cancer. And, and this is men with recurrences of prostate cancer. So these are men who've already had treatment but have a rising PSA level, uh, but without any other problem from the prostate cancer. And they're going to be randomised to metformin for six months uh, or a placebo to see if the PSA increase can be slowed uh, with metformin. And one of the great things I found out about metformin is that this is a drug that's not potentially repositionable just for cancer, but for what's called the ageing process. And as you all know, cancer is predominantly a disease of ageing and affecting older people, and ageing is associated with multiple different diseases. So older people aren't just at higher risk of cancer, but at higher risk of many other diseases. 
And in fact, if you give laboratory animals, worms or some strains of mice, metformin in their diet, they live longer. You know, these are healthy animals. They're not made to have a disease, but they just live longer. So there's a proposal in the US, and, and this is being discussed at length at the moment because it's a big undertaking. But what they want to do is select healthy people uh, who are between 70 and 80 years of age and more than 3,000 and randomise them to receive metformin or a placebo to look at their health risk across conditions including cancer, heart disease uh, and dementia uh, with the idea of extending what's now referred to as a health span, not a lifespan. In other words, helping older people stay healthy longer through uh, preventing uh, life-threatening diseases. Now, thalidomide. Uh, everyone's heard of thalidomide. I'm sure everybody's heard of thalidomide. Uh, thalidomide was developed uh, in the 1950s as a treatment uh, for nausea and vomiting, uh, and it was a very effective drug for nausea and vomiting. Uh, but uh, as we all know, uh, it was withdrawn uh, from the market because uh, severe malformations were noted uh, in uh, children of women uh, who were uh, taking the drug uh, for nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. Uh, and these malformations uh, typically were things like shortening or absence uh, of the arms or legs. And I, I'm sure you remember the story uh, and uh, perhaps have uh, seen some of these are very brave survivors. Uh, through the 1970s and 1980s, thalidomide was still around and it was used for certain very rare conditions. Uh, it, in the early days of HIV AIDS, it was used for some AIDS-related conditions uh, and it was also found to actually be of benefit in a rare type of leprosy, uh, which by and large is uh, not, uh, not seen in the Western uh, world. Uh, but the drug was actually re-approved in 1998 for the treatment of this rare form of leprosy. Now, this is another of these cartoons, and this is for myeloma. Now, myeloma uh, is a type of cancer that arises in certain cells that are predominantly in the bone marrow. So it's a bone marrow type cancer uh, and uh, tumours in the bone marrow uh, have the same sort of micro environment but around them are not just the other cells that we've talked about but also bone cells, so called osteoblasts and osteoclasts uh, and there are these supporting bone marrow cells and they all talk to each other in the same way that we've done before. Uh, in 1965, uh, there was one case report published in the medical literature of a patient with myeloma who was given thalidomide, uh, I believe because of nausea and vomiting related to the myeloma. And in fact, there was some reported slowing down of the myeloma. Uh, and that all got forgotten for about 30 years until the mid-1990s, uh, when a very bright person in the US said, I've got a few patients with myeloma who've exhausted all available treatment, uh, but I'm going to try and give them thalidomide. And he treated five people, and one of them showed a favourable response to treatment. So this led to the introduction of thalidomide into clinical trials for myeloma in 1997. And the first report came out in 1999 uh, of uh, 84 patients with myeloma and about a third of them showed a favourable effect from receiving thalidomide. However, there were problems. Uh, thalidomide was developed as a short-term treatment for nausea and vomiting. It wasn't developed for some, as something you would give for a long time uh, and it wasn't developed for something 
uh, where people were already you know, have, uh, sick with an underlying condition. It was developed for people you know, who were having nausea. So it became apparent there were significant side effects from the drug, uh, including troublesome constipation, uh, fatigue and extreme tiredness, damage to peripheral nerves, and a risk of developing DVTs or venous thromboses. And in particular, older patients uh, had great trouble tolerating thalidomide uh, and myeloma, like many other cancers, is predominantly a disease of older persons. So although the drug showed benefit, it was also showing some problems. Nevertheless, larger randomised trials were done, uh, and this is a summary that was reported in a meeting uh, last year, uh, and this uh, what we call survival curves. So across here is the amount of time since the patients received uh, thalidomide or other treatment, and along here is the percentage of people who are still alive. And so obviously the higher up you are, the better. Uh, and this curve represents people who were receiving treatment without thalidomide, uh, and this is reflecting people who were receiving treatment including thalidomide. And this is a large number of patients, six randomised trials with almost 1,700 patients with myeloma, unequivocally showing that the people who received thalidomide lived longer with an average survival of 39 months versus 32 months. And this is quite a significant benefit for people with myeloma, which although it can be quite a protracted disease and for which there are a lot of other treatments, uh, is not curable uh, except in very rarely in younger patients who are fit enough to have bone marrow transplants and things like this. So as, part of, uh, as a result of this, uh, thalidomide was reapproved for the treatment of myeloma in the US in 2006 uh, and was approved, uh, I'm not sure of the exact date, in Australia. Because of the risk of uh, birth defects, a comprehensive what's called REMS or Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy was enforced to prevent the drug inadvertently being taken by pregnant women. And this included uh, doctor and pharmacist certification, so you had to have training before, you couldn't just prescribe it, you had to have an, go through a training course. Uh, there were a lot of patient education tools. Uh, younger female patients had to have uh, regular mandated pregnancy uh, tests. And the drug was only dispensed in limited amounts. Uh, so you could only get it for four weeks' supply, then you had to revisit the doctor, go through the process to stop people sort of accumulating repeat prescriptions and having it sort of hanging around in people's homes. And this led to the development of other drugs, and thalidomide now is largely superseded in myeloma by these newer drugs which are very similar to thalidomide uh, but have a much a better safety profile. So they're much less likely to cause the thalidomide side effects that I talked about before, although because they're based on thalidomide, they are still at risk of causing birth defects. So you still have to have the same sort of risk evaluation program. Uh, and these are drugs called lenalidomide and pomalidomide, uh, the latter of which has recently been funded in Australia, and you may have seen that announced in the last week or so. Lenalidomide has been around for a few more years. So this is, this is a, a copy of a, a management guidelines for myeloma. These are US guidelines from last year, just to prove to you that, in fact, thalidomide is still listed in as a potential treatment with other drugs uh, for patients with myeloma. Uh, and this is lenalidomide. This was a drug that was investigated in clinical trials 
uh, in the 2000s, uh, but, uh, and including many centres in Australia. Uh, and uh, in this trial, in uh, patients with myeloma who had exhausted all treatments, these are the same survival curves. Uh, the people receiving the lenalidomide in the solid lines clearly surviving longer. And this is a graph of their time to worsening of the myeloma, and that clearly took a lot longer in the people receiving lenalidomide. So from the thalidomide story, we've got a repurposing of a very old drug, uh, and we've got the development of newer derivatives of that drug that are looking even better. I'll skip that. But it only works for myeloma. Thalidomide was tested in virtually all other types of cancer to see if it would have the same benefits as it did in myeloma, and it doesn't. And it's probably because the, that so-called microenvironment for myeloma cells is different to that surrounding cells or cancers that are not arising in the bone marrow. Now, some of these newer drugs have been used in certain other bone marrow cancers, certain lymphomas and certain other hematologic cancers with some benefit. But this approach, unfortunately, is not translated to the other common types of cancer. But are there drugs out there that can directly target cancer cells. So we've talked about metabolism and we've talked about microenvironment. We've talked about the things surrounding cells and what we can target. Is there a drug out there that we don't know about that might be an undiscovered magic bullet for a certain type of cancer? How do we know that there isn't? Well, here's a story that has happened in the last few years. It's not one I've been involved in, uh, but it's something I've been following with interest because it's a cancer that I see quite a lot of. And that is small cell lung cancer and certain of the older antidepressants that were called tricyclic antidepressants, you may have heard of these, drugs like imipramine and desipramine. Uh, which were effective and widely used antidepressant medications, uh, but have now largely been superseded by the newer classes of antidepressants uh, like the SSRIs, mainly because uh, they newer drugs have much less side effects. And a couple of years ago, a very elegant series of laboratory experiments were done that suggested these older antidepressants might be of use in small cell lung cancer. Now, small cell lung cancer is about 15% of lung cancers, uh, and lung cancer is common, so 15% is still quite a common cancer. Uh, it very rarely can be treated with surgery because nearly always when it's diagnosed, it's spread widely throughout the body. Uh, it responds pretty well initially to chemotherapy, but it then comes back, and most patients only live around 12 to 18 months. And we haven't found any new treatments for at least 10 years for this drug, so there's a real need to find something. And it looks a bit different under the microscope to other lung cancers. It's got what's called a neuroendocrine look, which means it's got certain properties of the tumour cells that are similar to certain cells affecting the neural and endocrine systems of the body. And sometimes you can get similar cancers arising uh, in organs outside the lung. So how did they work this out? Okay. Now we have enormous databases of what happens to cells when you treat them with drugs. These are various databases that have been compiled from millions upon millions of experiments where cells of all sorts, not just cancer cells, not small cell lung cancer cells, but different cancers, normal cells, have been exposed to all sorts of different drugs and treatments. And the effect on the cells on their 
DNA, on their protein expression. You can do all this. You can do this very comprehensively. And there's trillions of bits of information online through various publicly accessible databases, uh, which some of which are listed there. And what they did was they mined all these databases and they said there's something about small cell lung cancer cells when they're favourably affected by treatments that mimics something that happens when drugs such as these tricyclic antidepressants are given to certain normal cells. And that's about as complex as an explanation as I can give. So they, from mining existing databases, said there may be something, so let's do some experiments to see if that can actually be the case, and then if it is, we'll do some clinical trials. Uh, I'm not sure how well these will project. I couldn't make them any bigger. Uh, but what, they've, what they started is growing in the laboratory different samples of small cell lung cancer and other cancers as well. And they exposed these uh, growing cancer cells to different drugs, including these antidepressants, and looked at how many survived. And so when you look at these little graphs here, the black bars are those that were not treated, and the bars to the right, who are, which are a bit less shaded, are those that were treated. And the lower, the better. So you can see in these, many fewer cells survived when they were treated with these drugs, whereas some of the drugs, which were not related, had very little effect. And they found some mice and injected into them human small cell lung cancer cells and watched them grow. And they then fed the mice with various drugs, including uh, these antidepressants. And this is the growth of the tumours over time. These are the mice that got nothing, and these are the mice that got the antidepressants. And you can see the tumours grew much more slowly. And this is what the tumours look like. And I like this picture because anyone can see that these tumours are much smaller when the, drug, uh, when the mice are given the antidepressants than when they're not. We'll skip that one. So on the back of this, there was a great deal of enthusiasm and a trial was done very quickly in patients with small cell lung cancer and other similar type of these neuroendocrine cancers and they were treated with this old antidepressant. And unfortunately, it did not work. So despite all that wonderful science and those wonderful experiments, when it came to the crunch, it didn't work. So what are we doing here in this space? Um, we have a number of groups uh, in the city who are looking at experiments to try and find drugs that can be repositioned or repurposed to treat cancer. Some of my colleagues in the School of Medicine and Pharmacology have some work which uh, is suggesting that certain drugs may be benefit, uh, are beneficial to combine with some of the new immune treatments that are being developed for cancer. And hopefully that's something that will get up and running into clinical trials in the next few years. Some of my other colleagues in the Perkins uh, are looking at drugs, uh, older drugs that can be repurposed to try and treat melanoma. Uh, and again, this is something that has, in the very early stages, but at least in laboratory experiments, is showing some potential promise. But as we saw from that last example, that's still no guarantee of success. Uh, in my last two slides, I want to go away from this and just say something else. It's great to think that we can develop new drugs for cancer, but there's a lot we can also do to try and help cancer. Uh, these are the recommendations. Uh, this has come out of an, a, a, a meeting earlier this year uh, to try and reduce your risk of cancer. 
So if you are interested in reducing your risk of cancer, don't hang out for a medication that will reduce your risk. There are things that you can do now, and we all know these. Don't be overweight. Don't be physically active. Don't drink lots of sugary drinks. Eat the right foods. Limit red meats. Avoid processed meats. Limit alcohol intake. Don't use dietary supplements. They don't work and limit salt consumption. So if you can identify with the person over here, overweight, sitting on a couch, smoking and drinking, identify a little more with the person over here, which looks like uh, an unattainable goal to me, but <laughs> lean, plenty of fruit and vegetables, and just come back from a run. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. He's left a little bit of time for questions, and there is a roving microphone. So uh, there's a lady over that side, Melissa, if so, we can get the ball rolling. And because we're short on time, I might get you to start your question as soon as the microphone arrives, if that's all right. Uh, thank you for that uh, very informative talk. I uh, just wanted to um, share with you that I've had personal experience with uh, my husband taking metformin, and he had underlying liver problems, and he developed a form of dementia. It took four doctors to pick up the, uh, with the liver flap that he had this problem and I was advised to place him into a home. Once he stopped metformin, the liver flap stopped and he be uh, became normal. So I think colleagues will need to be informed to watch out for some of these other side effects that metformin has. Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting and thanks for sharing that. And um, you know, I think as far as metformin goes, it's still in trials. I'm not advocating that people use it you know, as a cancer treatment or cancer prevention. And it's interesting to hear that, yes, it can potentially have some side effects. So, you know, again, we need to be sure that we understand the risk and benefit of these medications. Yeah, I just want to share my experience with all of you. I had breast cancer in 2001. I had mastectomy and excision of limb nodes done. That was 14 years ago. And two years ago, the cancer cell has gone to the lung and lumbar one. And I was put on Femara uh, and Bondronet. I have two um, aspiration of pleural effusion in 2013. And every, now every six months, I have my CT scan done. And the cells, the cancer cells in the lung has diminished by one millimeter each time when I went for a CT scan. Thank you. Thank you, and I wish you all the best with your treatment. You've clearly had this cancer for a long time, and I, I hope you can live with it a lot longer. Um, just a comment, it's more generic. I have no idea about drugs, and I don't even know why it came today. But what, out of this report that you gave today, what stood out the most to me, which makes the most sense to me, is this. Every single human being sitting here, doesn't matter where on the planet, we are guinea pigs at any stage. Every time I choose to put drugs into my body, because you used the words during that presentation, which was may, 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 because you as a scientist, or at the end of the day, we don't know. So when I talk to people, whether they're in shopping centres or whatever, they confirm to you, oh yeah, that drug does definitely heal you or help. I say, no, it doesn't. And I and everybody, I, I really want to make that clear. I don't know why. We all own this body, and I have a choice. So it's my choice whether I want to use that drug, believe what I'm told, or not believe what I'm told. Maybe that's just what I had to say today. Thank you. Um, I've ex experienced about three or four different people dying of cancer. Um, I'm not a doctor. But one of the things that interests me is palliative care. Um, in Victorian times, uh, they used uh, things like morphine for pain relief. You haven't mentioned that. It's not as a cure of the cancer, just to make you feel better. And uh, then we can move on to 
recently on SBS, uh, the more synthesised versions of morphines, uh, the heroines, and, and now the other fancy name drugs. What do you think of the use of painkillers, especially if you, you know, you've got four or five years left? Uh, well, I mean, as we all know, painkillers are very commonly used to treat cancer-related pain, and uh, I wouldn't call... Oh, no, no. Okay, so, so cancer-related pain is uh, very commonly treated with the sort of painkillers that you describe, and clearly people who have uh, advanced cancer can have significant pain and may well require drugs like morphine or some of the derivatives of morphine. Uh, these I would not count as sort of repurposed or repositioned drugs because they were developed for pain. Uh, in terms of palliative care, uh, I can tell you that, in fact, pain control is obviously a critical part of managing people with cancer uh, in palliative care. Uh, and we certainly have evidence that patients with cancer who have good pain control even if, they experience, even if that requires high doses of drugs like morphine, actually live longer than patients who have poor pain control. So the idea that you know, you'd prescribe these drugs because you want to shorten people's lives uh, because you know, they're taking these drugs is actually not the case. You know, it helps the patients to receive good pain control and they can live uh, for a longer period of time with some reasonable quality of life. So, yeah, pain control is critically important and we use a lot of these drugs in cancer patients. Is it our immune system that's letting us down? Why does it allow these cancer cells to prosper? And is there any scientific basis that stress can cause cancer? Uh, okay, so that's two questions, uh, each of which we could talk for an hour uh, on. Um, the immune system is critically important in the development and spread of cancer. This has become apparent in the last 10 years or so. Yes, the immune system is letting us down because it can allow cancer to develop. Okay? The reason is that cancers are very clever and they have ways of talking to the immune cells and telling them to not be active. In other words, to turn them off and stop them eradicating the cancer. So our immune system was developed to fight infections and parasites and bacteria. You know, that's why we survive, because our immune system can destroy that type of cell. We don't have an immune system developed because we get cancer, because we generally only get cancer when we get old, and we've only been getting old for a very short period of our evolution. So we don't have an immune system that's tuned to recognise cancer as a serious problem. Uh, we are finding many ways to tweak the immune system to try and overcome this, and there's a lot of promising drugs being developed for cancer that are based on activating the immune system to make it recognise cancer. But our own innate immune system is not that good at doing so. Stress, look, there's an enormous amount of research about whether stress causes cancer, the evidence is not strong that it does, uh, and it's a difficult area to research because it's not something that you can do a sort of controlled experiment to try and work that out in human society. Um, looking at the data, uh, if it does cause cancer, it's a relatively small cause of cancer. I think that is it for the time, given that uh, we've got to get you back to the office, Michael? So, folks, what I might do is ask you firstly to join me in thanking Michael for what I thought was a very accessible and very helpful presentation. <laughs>